What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. So a seven-year-old boy presents to the pediatrician with a one-month history of headaches that are worse in the morning, frequent vomiting, difficulty with walking, with frequent falls, and vision changes. So you have a young child here. This has been going on for a significant period of time. It's not like this happened yesterday or acutely this morning. Let's take a look at the vitals here. The vitals are temperature 37 degrees Celsius, heart rate 80 beats per minute, blood pressure is 115 over 80, and then the respiration of 20. These are all normal vitals. So he's not running a fever. He's hemodynamically stable. So in terms of the vitals, he's okay. Patient has no significant past medical history, so he has no diagnosed congenital abnormality or inherited disorder that would be you know, explaining these symptoms, at least as far as we know at this point. The child has met all developmental milestones, so this is important because he's not delayed developmentally. These symptoms are not a result of some kind of delay in development. Physical exam is notable for papilledema, observed with the ophthalmoscope. Papilledema is enlarging of the optic nerve in the back of the eye, and you can see that when you look into the eye with an ophthalmoscope. We'll show you a picture on the next slide. And then truncal ataxia. Truncal ataxia is a wide-based kind of drunken sailor gait characterized by when the patient kind of has uncertainty with starting and stopping and then unequal steps. And then really what you observe is instability of the trunk that's often seen during sitting, hence the name truncal ataxia. And very often this is caused by pathology impacting the cerebellum, which is responsible for coordination and balance, which are both very important for controlling walking and having a stable, a stable gait. And then lastly here it says an MRI is obtained, which is shown below. So we'll go through this in a, in a few slides here. So bottom line here is these symptoms of headache, worse in the morning, frequent vomiting, difficulty walking with frequent falls, truncal ataxia, vision changes, which would be consistent with papilledema, in an otherwise healthy young child with no significant past medical history, developmentally normal, this is pointing to increases in intracranial pressure as is causing these symptoms. Here's some signs of in increased intracranial pressure. So you have headache. Vision changes would be mainly due to compressing the optic nerve, maybe also potentially compression of the occipital lobe, but you typically think of compression of the optic nerve, which is responsible for papilledema. And so you can see that here where you're observing in the ophthalmoscope in the back of the eye, here's swelling of the optic nerve or the optic disc in the back of the eye here. And so this is due to swelling of the optic nerve or compression on the optic nerve, which is very serious because it can lead to vision changes when, you have a, when you're affecting the optic nerve. You can also see vomiting with increased intracranial pressure, papilledema as we explained, and then abnormal gait as well. The other clue they give here is worse in the morning. So when you have a headache that's worse in the morning, that can often be due to pathological masses or causing increased intracranial pressure within the, within the skull. Because when you're sleeping, you have decreased ventilation. You're not breathing as heavily or as much. So what does that lead to is increased in your PCO2 which in the brain is a significant vasodilator. Then also while you're lying down, because you're sleeping, lying down also increases blood flow to the brain. And so these two together, vasodilation and increased blood flow to the brain, cause significant increase in intracranial pressure. So it further exacerbates the problem. So that's why these patients often complain that their headache is much worse in the morning because overnight by sleeping and lying down, that further increases their intracranial pressure. So some causes of increased intracranial pressure, intracranial hemorrhage, obviously, because again, the skull is a closed box. And so if you're filling it up with blood, that's going to obviously eventually increase the intracranial pressure. Stroke that causes a lot of damage to brain tissue, so inflammation, edema, and so that's gonna, that could cause increased intracranial pressure. Brain mass is obviously a tumor or an abscess. Infection causes a lot of inflammation, and then hydrocephalus as well, where you have enlargement of the ventricular system inside the brain, 
that can cause, you know, compression of cerebral structures. And then eventually, you know, again, there's only so much space. And so that would lead to increased intracranial pressure as well. So if we go through these answer choices, one, subarachnoid hemorrhage is typically an, a, an emergency. Usually patients are presenting to the ER with the worst headache of their life. And it's not like, oh, this is some bad headache that's been bothering them for a month. This is, you know, this is really is like the worst headache of their life. And so they're coming to the ER. And also patients that have subarachnoid hemorrhage, you know, usually due to a burst of a cerebral aneurysm. Uh, many of those patients don't even make it to the hospital alive. And of those that make it to the hospital, many of them don't survive either. You know, they're not some young kid pre presenting to the outpatient office. And so again, the history just doesn't fit there. Left middle cerebral artery infarction. Strokes are very rare in young children, especially he doesn't have any significant past medical history that would raise your eyebrow and make you think he has some kind of predisposition to developing an infarction in the cerebral circulation. Again, he would pre be presenting also with right upper extremity weakness, left facial droop, which you just don't see here. So it really leaves one of these last three answer choices. So hydrocephalus, either communicating or non-communicating, or ex vacuo ventriculomegaly. And so we'll go through these three over the next few slides. So first, communicating hydrocephalus. So let's just review here a little bit of CSF flow. So CSF is synthesized here in the choroid plexus, which is uh, very prominent here in the lateral ventricles. And then it goes through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. Remember, you have a lateral, lateral ventricle on either side. They both empty through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. From the third ventricle, it travels across this cerebral aqueduct, which is essentially this pipeline between the third and fourth ventricle. So that goes to the fourth ventricle. And then it makes its way through these channels where it essentially bays the brain and spinal cord in CSF. Now, at the end here, CSF is drained from the subarachnoid space, which is where it travels. CSF travels there through these arachnoid granulations, which are these essentially these protrusions from of the subarachnoid space into the superior sagittal sinus here. So this is where CSF flows all around, and then it's got to be emptied out somewhere because you're continuously synthesizing it here in the choroid plexus. So it's a continuous process. So it gets drained out here into the su superior sagittal sinus. And you can see that here, subarachnoid space here. As you can see, it's kind of named for arachnoid like spider web. And so it's traveling in here, and then here's that protrusion that we should, same thing up here, where it's draining into the venous system here. So communicating hydrocephalus is where you have an impaired CSF reabsorption at these arachnoid granulations within the superior sagittal sinus. You could also see excessive CSF production, but this is typically what the cause is. It's non-obstructive, so it's not like you have some kind of mass or pathology obstructing flow somewhere along the ventricular path here. So it's not obstructing CSF flow. CSF flow is completely normal throughout the system. It's just a drainage problem. There's multiple causes for this. You can have congenital malformation of the arachnoid granulations, and then you can also have scarring of the arachnoid granulations from things like infection, meningitis, inflammatory, or even hemorrhage. So blood can really scar up the arachnoid granulations, such as a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, a type of communicating hydrocephalus is normal pressure hydrocephalus, and this is typically seen in elderly patients, and this presents with that triad of dementia, ataxia, and urinary incontinence, also known by wet, wacky, and wobbly. Versus non-communicating hydrocephalus, this is caused by an obstruction of CSF flow at any point along the cerebral ventricular system. And so this would also can be called obstructive hydrocephalus. So it's caused by some kind of either the interventricular foramen, or you can have stenosis of that cerebral aqueduct. That's a congenital, typically congenital inherited disorder. You could also have a tumor or a mass pr pressing against it as well. You can have a mass pre pressing against the fourth ventricle as well. And again, other you know congenital malformations, tumor or hemorrhage also can cause these as well. So if we look at our patient, first let's take a look at the MRI scan. So this is an axial T2 MRI, and you know it's T2 versus T1 because on T2, fluid lights up, so in the eyes and then CSF as well. And one thing we'll note here is you, as you notice, it's pretty obvious, is you have a heterogeneous mass here in the cerebellum. So this would be the structure here and here are, are the hemispheres of the, of the cerebellum. And then you have to see this mass here. And typically, it's, it's almost obstruct, it's completely obstructed here, as you would see the fourth ventricle in here. As you can see in this diagram here is anterior to the cerebellum here. The cerebellum, it sort of encapsulates it or surrounds it. So if you have a mass, as we see here in this patient, in the cerebellum, if it gets large enough, can seriously impact and compress that fourth ventricle. So it seems like our patient 
as a non-communicating or obstructive hydrocephalus due to, the, to a cerebellar mass here. So just for completeness sake, hydrocephalus ex vacuo, this is enlargement of the ventricles secondary to the loss of brain parenchyma. And so you can see that here in this scan here, this is also a T, an axial T2 MRI. And you can see where CSF here in the ventricles is lighting up. CSF around the brain here is lighting up. And so this is due to there essentially you've lost brain tissue and what happens is the ventricles essentially fill in that space that was originally filled in by brain tissue and causes this can be brain atrophy such as in dementia or even alzheimer's brain injury and then some psych psychiatric disorders can you can see this as well such as schizophrenia and the difference between traditional hydrocephalus which we talked about in the previous slides and hydrocephalus ex vacuo is it's a really a compensatory enlargement of structures containing csf so it's not due Due to some kind of blockage in the ventricular system or some kind of impairment in CSF drainage. It's really just that these structures are filling in the space. They're allowed to expand and fill in the space that was previously occupied by brain tissue. So it does not cause an increase in CSF pressure nor ICP. So back to the case here, we know it's one of these last three answer choices here. Given that it's a, a cerebellar mass impacting the fourth ventricle causing obstruction, it's not likely a communicating hydrocephalus. Again, that's due to impaired CSF CSF reabsorption. Again, this looks likely that it's a non-communicating hydrocephalus because you have increased intracranial pressure, which you could also see in communicating hydrocephalus. That's not exclusive to non-communicating. But the main thing here is obstruction of CSF flow caused by this cerebellar mass here. And then it's not likely ex vacuo ventriculomegaly because this is, again, a ventricular enlargement in response to loss of brain tissue. And again, you know, this is a young boy. It's not an elderly patient with dementia or a patient with a history of mental illness like schizophrenia he hasn't suffered any kind of brain trauma that's you know noted here in the history so again not likely this answer choice either and so the most clear answer here is non-communicating hydrocephalus secondary to this cerebellar mass so a follow-up question here would be is which of the following is the underlying pathology so which of the following would cause non-communicating hydrocephalus so let's go through the answer choices here left posterior communicating artery aneurysm now if you remember from the previous da vinci cases we talked about this this can cause a ocular motor nerve palsy or cranial nerve 3 palsy if it ruptures it leads to a subarachnoid hemorrhage again he's not presenting with this and then he's not presenting obviously with a subarachnoid hemorrhage next choice here congenital stenosis of the cerebral axis aqueduct there's no previous history of this and this is an inherited defect in the cerebral aqueduct as we previously described and you just don't see that on the imaging what you see here is this very large mass impacting the fourth ventricle here medulloblastoma this is a malignant tumor of the cerebellum this seems like a very likely case medulloblastoma on MRI often appears as this appears here where it's very heterogeneous it's found in the cerebellum or the posterior fossa and very often impacts the fourth ventricle meningioma this is a tumor that arises from the meninges which is that those tissues covering the central nervous system structures the brain and the spinal cord these typically as you can see here appear homogeneous on imaging and they originate from these meninges so they're usually found on the outer surface of brain tissue although as you can see here they can begin to encroach on and impact brain tissue but if you compare it to here you see a very heterogeneous mass found in the cerebellum so it's much more indicative of a medulloblastoma and that's our answer choice so this patient has a non-communicating hydrocephalus secondary to a medulloblastoma within the cerebellum impacting the fourth ventricle all right that's all i have for you this week make sure you check back every wednesday for new da vinci cases in the meantime subscribe to our channel for more videos and then be sure to download the PDF notes for this video on our website at dviacademy.com. Also on our site, you can find our book and video packages for anatomy and biochemistry. And if you want to listen to DaVinci Cases on the go, the audio is available on Spotify. You can also follow us on Instagram for weekly posts and video. And then lastly, if you have any questions about the content of this video or about DaVinci Academy, put them in the comments and our team will be sure to answer them. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.